I got to count it the other another billion dollars I lost. I've lost two <laughs> two billion dollars in the last two days. It's oh, fucking you guys business. recording? Please record this. Looks like we <laughs> <laughs> looks like we need a poker game tomorrow. <laughs> Can you imagine how tilted Chamath is going to go into yeah, the poker he's game? Gonna, he's going to be a million be, in the markets. <laughs> he's going to buy in for two million just to try and get even. <laughs> Hey everybody, hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the All In Podcast. We took a week off, and boy, that was sad. I missed you guys, I missed my besties. Well, we should tell, we should tell people we had, a, we had a small medical procedure for one of the besties, and uh, but everything's good, and uh, it was planned, so you know, nothing, nothing out of the ordinary, but we just needed to take a week off, so that's why we missed a week, and that's why we're back. Yes, and one of the besties... Uh, God, I got so many jokes. I'm not going to tell. <laughs> All the jokes that came into my mind right now would get we'll me get canceled. Get you canceled? Really? <laughs> I just, well, I literally had seven jokes. I can't tell any of them. Based on the amount of money that I've lost in the last two days, I'm ready to get canceled. So it's fine. So I'll just <laughs> give them nothing. Put them in the chat, and I'm just going to fucking let them rip. All right, everybody. David Sachs, the Rain Man, is here calling in from an undisclosed compound. Miami. Freeberg, the Queen of Quinoa, back in action, and. The dictator himself, licking his wounds, two billion dollars his- for billion a day. <laughs> Keep it going. <laughs> checking the Apple stock app, hitting refresh, and going. Thank God these companies have fundamentals because I haven't seen this much blood since Jason, Game of Thrones. Jason, honestly, at th- at this run rate, I can lose. A trillion dollars. Yeah. <laughs> Tomorrow, how this do you feel page, today? You're be more yeah. than me. <laughs> I could be sad. Mean, oh how does today God. feel compared to last March when the same thing was happening? You know, every day the market was down ten percent. Well, this and is I, what's important I think, I think to we, remember. We made, we, we made a joke. It was like it could only go down ten percent so many days in a row. March, March thirty uh, first. You you guys have to remember that March thirty first of two thousand and twenty. The headlines all over the press, and you can. You know, go to the Wayback Machine and look at these things. But the Dow was down 20 some odd percent. The S&P was down 20 percent. And it looked like the world was going to end. And then we had our first big stimulus bill. Um, and things started to look – China started to reopen slowly and things started to look better. And what's interesting is you have this rotational sort of deleveraging – that's happening right now. People are repricing in inflation. People are moving into sort of these – you know, overlooked stories getting out of growth a little bit, and it's a bloodbath. Um, but I would just, I would just encourage us all to remember that we were in some pretty dark days in March of last year as well. And you know, when you looked at it by the end of the year, it looked amazing. So I would just add to that: the markets are looking pretty grim for tech stocks right now. But this all started because of a really great jobs report showing that the economy is roaring back. So we added. 379,000 jobs in February, which beat expectations by 200,000. They also revised the January gains up 166,000. So now the unemployment rate is down to 6.2%. Remember, it was at like 15%, you know, last summer during the, the lockdowns for COVID. So, I mean, all of this is fundamentally due to, I think, really great news in the economy because COVID is ending. And which kind of begs the question of why we need another $1.9 trillion stimulus bill. But but I think that ultimately, there's a lot of good news in the real economy. And what investors are doing is figuring out how to now price or reprice uh, all these different stocks in light of the economy roaring back. So just a and little so- just a little math lesson to build on what you're saying. You know, everybody has a risk-free rate and all stocks are priced according to that risk-free rate. And when, you know, for the many, for the last sort of year, particularly when risk free rates were essentially zero to negative, meaning, you know, that's, that's the riskless money where you, that you get from the government. Um, it was hard to do anything except be long growth stocks in a big, big way. Um, but David, to your point, if we get two or three more quarters of these kinds of jobs numbers, you're going to have a, you know, low single digit unemployment number. And what that means is wages will have to go up for businesses to compete. And that's the kind of traditional form of inflation that actually reprices things because you then you lever up rates to kind of control inflation. When you lever up rates and you, you know, all of a sudden they're not zero, but they're two, three, four, five, six percent, 
this is sort of what brought the tech bubble to a halt in 2000, which is that, you know, you had 6% real rates. And so you can't own businesses that are projecting revenues, let alone profits in 2026. Um, when you can invest your money in a bond and make 6%. 6%. And, and that's you know, what I like. So just for folks that don't know, this week started with this big bond sell off. And what that means is bonds that used to yield 0% when you sell them, they're now yielding 10 year treasuries, I think are at one and a half points, right? And so as an investor, if I can make one and a half percent with no risk by owning US treasuries over the next 10 years, that may feel like a better bet than owning some risky asset, um, some speculative company. Now, the other thing that that it has done, and Chamath, correct me if I'm off on this, but what I'm hearing is that that higher rate, because bonds sold down, because people are expecting inflation to come back up, the interest rates to borrow money are going up. And so if you're a hedge fund or an institutional money manager, over the last year or so, you've been able to borrow money for 0%. You can lever up your portfolio and, 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 and buy as many stocks as you want without paying any interest on it. And now that rates are creeping back up, people are delevering, they're, they're taking risk off. And that's causing a sell off in both bonds and stocks. And especially on the speculative end of the market where you know, there's been um, obviously unchecked kind of investment capital. No, you're, you're, in. you're, 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 you're absolutely right. Like, look, at the, at, the, at the end of the day, the cost of borrowing for a company goes up. What that's really saying is the investor that's lending them the money, um, you know, has other alternatives. Um, and so then they're willing to charge you more and more for this for this capital. And as that happens, you'll see some companies get into potentially some real trouble because, you know, they're going to be borrowing money at rates where they can't necessarily generate the cash flows in the future to pay those things back. At the same time, as you said, if you look at sort of like, you know, the SPAC market has taken a real beating. Um, what are what are SPACs really? Well, you know, in many ways, SPACs are synthetic bonds, right? And And the reason is because you know, if you go and buy a, if you go and buy a SPAC, a sh one share of any SPAC, you have the ability to redeem that if you don't like the deal that it does and get back your coupon. So, you know, your notional rather. So, if you were to buy a government, you know, German bond at negative one percent, or buy any SPAC where you can put that same, you know, ten dollars to work and get back ten dollars, well, you'd do that versus getting back nine dollars and ninety cents. So in many ways, like, you know, the SPAC market benefited from rates at zero because you could synthetically be long SPACs as almost a way of being synthetically long fixed income. Now, as rates go up, that's not true. So what that leaves in the SPAC market are actually people who want to own long-term equity. And if you combine that with what we just said, which is the cost of capital going up and the discount rate going up, now all of a sudden companies need to be really real. And you're seeing that because if you look at the companies that have just announced SPAC deals just in the last few days, their stocks have gotten absolutely obliterated. And they're right on the knife's edge going into the redemption period. So if you have one or two more months of this where all of a sudden bonds look better, and you know, some of these SPACs post announcement, but pre de spacking go through, you know, 10 bucks a share, people will just redeem for $10. Um, and you'll have a, you'll have a bunch of busted IPOs or mergers. by the way by the way another thing we're seeing sorry Jason but another thing I think we're seeing right now is in the near term is a feedback loop so as selling takes place what happens is market participants are jumping in and short selling and participating in the trend of that stock and so there are these these kind of experiences that are underway where it's not just about a sell off of owners but it's also about a momentum trade that a lot of people are playing into and so there is a very short term extremely compounded effect uh, of the delevering that's happening and the cycling that's happening in these markets. Uh, and so it's super volatile and probably will be for a little bit of, of, of time here, right? I think so. I think we need to figure out whether there's really, um, whether there's a real inflation risk dragon cooking someplace. If, if, yeah. there, if there really is inflation, like, again, you have to think like the trillions of dollars we put into the economy eventually has to come out in productive goods and services. And the, all of that excess capital will probably inflate prices. Now, it begs a different question, which is we maybe we've just actually been missing inflation all along. Because if you ask somebody who lives in a city, you know, what the cost of rent has been, that that thing has been inflating by feels like 20% a year for years. So 
and you know, healthcare maybe, and education costs and healthcare I mean, and education costs. Ones, yeah. So maybe we've just done a really terrible job in the last few years of actually measuring inflation the way it should be. You know, it's calling this whole basket well, of you know, e- you know, CPI X energy. Like, I mean, it's kind of nutty. Maybe the whole thing just made no sense a few well, years ago. Well, if you anyways. look to to David's point, and David gave me just a huge bag of red pills while we were off this week, so I've been <laughs> just. I've been on a bender on these red pills. But if you look at those three categories, what do they have in common? Education, healthcare, and housing, massive regulation. Uh, And then if you look at the things that have gone down, consumer goods, electronics, food, et cetera, or or have stayed flat in terms of inflation, those are things that the free market participates in. The the government's not involved. And it's not just the fact there's a lot of government regulation in things like healthcare and education. It's also that the government pays for a significant portion of it. And so there's no reason for the people, you know, who are billing the government to keep costs down. I mean, this is why the price of education of a college degree keeps going up is because the government's well, paying for a lot of it. I, I, so, I, I, J- David, you probably, I, I think you, you may have seen this, but when, you know, when we announced um, our merger with Clover for IPOC, one of the first slides I put up there was the only place in the market since 2010 where you would have made more money than being long Facebook and Google and Apple and Amazon was being long United Healthcare, <laughs> Cigna, Wellspring. And the reason is because healthcare was this incredible thing post Obamacare. You know, nobody wants to talk about it on the left because it makes it look terrible, but we created massive price inflation. And J- United Healthcare was a $30 billion company. Narrative right before, violation, be careful. <laughs> right, before, right before Obamacare passed, today it's a $330 billion company. Um, and the level of growth that they and Aetna and you know, Cigna and, and Wellspring, these com- these companies have have seen is astounding. So these highly right. regulated, you know, systems right, of societal infrastructure, whew, that's where all the yeah. gains have been. Regulatory capture writ large. Right. Well, as soon as the government is paying for it, all the suppliers know they can increase their prices. Why wouldn't yeah. they? So it, it, it's what happens is the government tries to make something free for people and all they end up doing is making it really expensive. Well, they make, it, they, they make we it. They make it. They make it now. <laughs> they make. They make it expensive in this very in this very convoluted way, which is hard to track, right? Because it's like, you know, uh, who's actually paying? Well, you know, the insurance companies want to just book more revenue, even if they're, you know, pr- even if their gross aggregate profit grows much, much more slowly. They'd rather make the same amount of profit on a billion dollars versus a hundred million dollars. So, what do they do? Their incentive is to just jack prices up. Who are paying those prices? Companies pay those prices. Who bears those costs? All of this stuff is really not clear because ultimately downstream, somebody has to pay for this stuff. Taxpayers. And it's all obscurified. I mean, look, I mean, look at the tent story that we were sharing on our group group thread, $61,000 for San Francisco to put people into tents with a no big contract. Uh, and one question I have for, for you all um, is, if we look back the last time we were at 6% unemployment, July 2014, we look at the unemployment graph, it spiked up to, as we discussed, 15%. And it has plummeted back down now to uh, the 6% rate. If we look back on this moment in time, and how quickly the economy is recovering from this disaster that we've never experienced before, it looks like this recession is going to be recovered. And we're going to we're already back in business in such a short period of time compared to what happened in the Great Recession and the dot com boom? So, is America and the U.S. dollar and the economy anti fragile now? To use a Taleb term, what? what do, how do we look at what yeah, happened look, with the economy? Did Trump do everything right with the stimulus? This is a this is a complete outlier in the following way. In a typical recession, what what has to happen is so you have a contraction in the economy, but you don't know when the bottom is. Right, the bottom is some number of months in the future. And government policy is basically trying to create a soft landing where all of a sudden the cost of capital is low enough now where people say, ah, on the margin now, this incremental dollar, I would rather borrow and invest, which drives growth, which can then gets the economy gro- going. And so, you know, how, how does a government deal with that? They are looking at economic data and saying, okay, you know what? Let me cut rates. I'll cut rates again. I'll cut rates again. And that's really the one tool that they have in their toolbox because they're trying to predict in the future, how many rate cuts do I need to get or have rather? How big do they need to be? Um, until I get to that place where you bottom out. 
The pandemic was the exact opposite because in many ways, we actually hit the bottom in month one because we said everything go to zero right now, right? When you shut everything down, you technically can't have less economic activity than zero. Than zero. <laughs> yeah. And so, and so in many ways, you price the bottom on day one, boom. And in hindsight, you know, the, the real insight would have been to, to see <clears throat> that and say, I'm buying this moment because it only gets better from here. So in, in one ways, like all of the tools, are, are actually now we need to think about them in opposite. And I don't think we have that training to do that well. So we're still going back to the same toolbox, which is why what David said is so true. You know, we're thinking about incremental stimulus as a, as like a way to get to a soft landing, but we've already actually taken the hard medicine a year so ago. So let's, let's tackle that. Sachs, should we, and let's, let's take virtue signaling and populism out of this discussion just on an economic basis. Is it necessary to send every American, another 600,000, 2,000, knowing what we know today, with the unemployment rate going down, we would be redder, or we'd be better off taking that capital and deploying it in education, right. uh, unemployment, well, look, all, or something right, else? Well, first of all, it's 1.9 trillion that we don't have, we're borrowing it. I mean, I would extend unemployment for people in those hard hit sectors that haven't come back yet. But most of this money is going for blue state bailouts of cities that are totally mismanaged. Uh, this is not going to help states like uh, California or, or cities like San Francisco get their house in order because this is going to bail them out and defer that day of reckoning from their chronic mismanagement. So we're borrowing money we don't have to bail out people cities and states that don't really deserve it. Um, I do think we should help the people who've been impacted, but um, but it doesn't require $2 trillion. And look, here's the thing. We're already down to 6% unemployment. We're going to be down to, I'd say, probably 3 or 4% in two quarters. I mean, the economy is coming roaring back. And the reason it's coming roaring back is because COVID is ending, right? So the biggest announcement recently, and I think this is playing into what's happening in the stock market as well, is that Biden – announced that every American who's over the age of 16 who wants a vaccine will be able to get one by the end of May. By the end of May. I mean, we're going to have yeah, what, what, 300 wait, what happened million to the fall? doses. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, he was six months I mean, off this. Just, yeah. When he came in office in January, he's p saying the worst is not over. Blah, I mean, that was clearly sandbagging. The worst was over. And we're going to have 300 million doses by the end of May. And the only reason why everybody won't be able to get one is because of states that are, you know, creating these ridiculous hoops to get through confiscating them. Yeah, exactly. Like California right now is, has 3 million doses sitting on a shelf because of all the crazy hoops that Gavin Newsom has everyone going through because he wants to score uh, brownie points on equity. Right. Um, so if the government would just get out of the way, let everyone who wants to get a vaccine, get one without worrying about making sure the exact right person in the exact right line gets one first, this thing will be over by Memorial day over. Now, look, there'll still be a case here or there uh, for sure. There'll be, I'm not saying there'll be zero cases of COVID, but there'll be zero pandemic understood as such. By the way, I'll, I'll also say one other, um, you know, important point about the stimulus uh, one that, that Sachs made. Yesterday, the CBO put out a, a, a projection. Uh, this is the, um, the budget office, uh, at, I think Congress, and they said that the um, US national debt is likely to reach 202% of GDP by 2051. So the amount of debt that the US government will own um, is 2x the amount of all the revenue generated by all of the industries in the US um, in, in about 30 years. That's an insane statistic. And the reason that people look at, you know, GDP or debt to GDP is because you have to pay your debt down at some point. So you owe some interest on that debt, you have to pay it down. And every year you have to generate revenue to pay the bondholders. And the, how do you how does the federal government generate revenue? It either issues more debt or taxes. And in order to meet a 202% level of debt relative to GDP, you end up raising taxes so significantly as a percent of GDP to cover the, uh, the, uh, the interest payments and, the, and the, the principal payments every year that you end up stalling out the economy, cutting important services, etc. Um, and so we're in a circumstance now where the, the, the benefit we're going to get from taking on this additional debt relative to economic growth and stimulus um, doesn't actually uh, outweigh the cost of that debt. And we're facing a fiscal crunch at some point in the next decade or two. And there is this fl this big question mark outstanding right now on a global stage. Is the dollar really the safest place um, to be? It, does everyone really want to be dollar denominated if this is the circumstance that the U.S. federal government is going to be facing? Uh, Here's a uh, question for Chamath that I'm curious about. If the government is buying all this debt, 
shouldn't they be buying some amount of equity as well so they can profit from well, the government's issuing debt, Jason? No, I know. But isn't the government also going into the market and buying up corporate debt through all no, of this? They, and shouldn't they, they have profits they, coming from no. that? So th there, there was a risk last year where, you know, corporates may not have been able to fund their obligations. And so the government basically said, we're going to be the buyer of the last resort and step in. And it's e effectively what they did was they, they, they essentially froze the credit markets because if you were going to then bet on some of these companies not being able to raise capital, you would have gone to the worst part of the, you know, the stack, or you would have bet actually that there was going to be the state transition. So meaning debt is very tightly scripted as, you know, triple A plus, you know, double A, A minus. And these transitions from these tiers of like investment grade to junk to whatever are huge events. And basically, the government said, No, uh, everybody take your chips and go home because we are going to backstop companies like Ford or whoever folks that were teetering. And so they, they effectively said, this is going to be, you know, until I tell you otherwise, a rigged game. I'm going to make sure I backstop these things. These companies will always be able to have money. So my question, though, Chamath, is if the government is going to do that and take that risk, shouldn't they get some warrants or some upside in the company's future success to then create a virtuous cycle here that if they did backstop it, maybe they had warrants for 5% of the company, like you would give if you were doing a debt instrument? They could probably do it if they were uh, a direct lender. And they, they had that chance and they didn't really do it in 2008 when they did it. I mean, maybe they could have done it in a better way. Here, when you enter the open market, there's no such contract. And so you can't negotiate that. Look, I, I, I want to sort of talk about something slightly related to this, which is, if you actually looked at that $1.9 trillion stimulus bill, the thing that makes the most sense, and I think nobody would complain about was saying, let's give a means based test, where the poorest Americans get the most money, call it five or 6,000. And the richest Americans get nothing. And I think yes. nobody would disagree with that. And if you added up all of that money, it's probably on the order of 500 or 700 billion dollars. If you did it, if you did a really expansive package and, and, and I think people would, I mean, all of us would raise our hands and say, we shouldn't get a fucking dime. Well, and, I mean, right. you know, people, other people right. should be getting many multiples of 1400. Well, okay? Why should anybody who wasn't impacted Sachs get anything? Like if you right. were not well, impacted, yeah, of course, you didn't lose of your course. job, you, we you're staying home, you're not spending money. Why should you get anything? Because I think that's all the money going into NFTs and making right. bets on GameStop and doing all this, of course. you know, shenanigans with Bitcoin. Of course. Look, this is Rahm Emanuel 2.0. Remember Rahm Emanuel back in the 2008-2009 financial crisis said never let a crisis go to waste. This is now never let a crisis reach its end. Right. They don't want it to be over because this crisis That's is a, a justification. Segue. Yeah. This crisis is the justification for this piggy bank of spending that this, this wish list that they wanted to pass for a long time. Very little of it actually has to do with helping the people. Very little. Hurt very by, little. By In COVID. fact, if you actually right. look at the, the breakdown of this $1.9 trillion bill, it's every typical bill. It has a better title. But ultimately, it's a bunch of pork barrels. Spending. By the way, th there's a bunch of insanity in there, like COVID testing. I mean, guess what? We don't need to test anyone for COVID in about yeah, 30 days. Yeah, you can throw those days. tests away. We needed them there's six months ago. There's a couple billion ago. dollars we could Dummies. save, you know, I, and, the, and the list goes on. But I think the point is, uh, what Sachs is making is totally true. We're, we're continuing to latch on to the COVID pandemic crisis as a means to an end. Um, and we're not really solving uh, any problems that are outstanding. As the COVID pandemic and the risks, remember, let, let's just go back a year. If you guys remember, the reason we shut down the economy was to flatten the curve. There was no assumption we were going to end COVID. The idea was let's make sure that the healthcare system doesn't get overwhelmed with people dying yeah, where ICUs. we can't handle as many people in ICU beds. And now we're in a situation where we're saying you still can't go outside. ICU beds are largely open. You still have to do X and Y and Z. We still need to be testing everyone. And all of those risks and considerations should be coming off the table as more people have had COVID and more people have gotten vaccinated. And instead, we're using the fear that's been embedded in us over the past year as a mechanism to drive spending in a way that is clearly economically unsustainable, um, ultimately counterproductive, and unfortunately is being you know used as a mechanism for keeping folks in office and, and paying back their friends and all this other sort of nonsense. That's Freeberg, going on. you had a you had a breakdown of uh, it, it, by the way, because it's not just the the federal stimulus bill, you know, the the California breakdown of what Insane. they spent. Insane. 
Do you and have that? Do you have that? Yeah. Or can you fill it you up? Know, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send the link because it was a, through a FOIA request. They were forced to list it. So California de- had an emergency declaration. Joke. A total uh, fucking joke. How through much that, money through that emergency declaration, it gave the governor the power and the ability to enter into no bid contracts to meet the, the demands of the quote unquote emergency. And the contracts that were entered into are all publicly listed and available in a link that I will share with you guys. Um, and it'll be available online. I don't think a reporter has done what needs to be done, which is to go through those contracts and identify how much money was spent on what and where that and why that money was spent and who ended up benefiting from it. Some of these contracts, including, for example, $1.9 billion to Perkin Elmer to provide nasal swabs and other, you know, reactive chemistry needed to run COVID tests with an overflow capacity of their lab of 4,000 tests a day, which by the way, costs a few thousand dollars um, for $1.9 billion. And ultimately, California didn't really do any of the testing. It was done by private labs. Where did that $1.9 billion go? Uh There was another amount of money. There was $100 million spent on Accenture to build the vaccination website. No bid contract. $100 million for a friggin' three-page website. Didn't that guy build that website in a weekend? The Carbon Health guy did. There was another, um, uh, separately for his own vaccination program that he was running, which, you know, obviously highlights just how inept this whole process is. There was another um, incredible multi-hundred million dollar contract entered into for a guy. and, And then I looked up his address on Google Maps and I looked at his home and his office. It's in like a strip mall next to a donut shop. And this guy is the guy, he's a, he's technically a doctor, but not really a practicing doctor who would, who got paid hundreds of millions of dollars to source overflow, um, hospital and doctor capacity for prisons in the, in, in, in California, insane, the shit that's in there. And so, um, you know, the, 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 the total kind of, um, I think mismanagement of capital and obviously inability to kind of manage why, through a crisis, get taken advantage fuck? of. Yeah. Why and I, the by fuck? the way, I think, I think the COVID, the fiscal, the, the federal COVID stimulus looks very similar in terms of the, the pork and other nonsense that's going on in there. It makes, yeah. Hey, mainstream media, instead of fucking grinding me about, you know, a couple hundred million dollars of share <laughs> sales so that I can allocate it to fucking climate change. Why don't you do your goddamn job and fucking tell this story? Yeah, no, because this would take work. What a joke. You don't get yeah. virtue signaling points. What a joke. I'll post the link now. David, more, I need more red pills. What a joke. Get me those red pills from Miami. What so there's one joke. There's one article, like, uh, you're right, Jamath. Like, they, they, there's so many scandals. By the way, there was one just reported in the San Francisco Chronicle about how the city of San Francisco paid $16 million to, uh, to pay for something like 260 tents or something tents. like that. Tents. Tense. For homeless people, it was sixty-one thousand dollars. By the way, that's the entire budget of Burning Man. <laughs> you just it was sixty-one thousand dollars per tent. You could build an ADU for that, guys. I have an entire gaggle of reporters sweating every single fucking share that I buy or sell, and these and you people. Love it. No, no, I don't. This is it's oh. stu- fucking stupid. And 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 there's true. There's trillions, trillions of dollars just swashing around. Right. Like what? what it are was we some all- third world fucking banana republic? Kind of. Go ahead, Zach. San Francisco is, that's for sure. All this money, all this money, all this money was dished out according to no bid uh, contracts. So so basically, there was not a competitive bidding process because it was a COVID emergency. And so, yeah, look, I mean, all of uh, Newsom's big backers in the healthcare industry got these giant no bid contracts. These, you know, the homeless industrial complex service providers in San Francisco got these giant contracts. None of it was bid out. Uh, and the politicians would love to be able to keep this going because they've never had more power. They've never had m- more degrees of freedom to reward their political supporters. So, uh, you know, I, I think there, there was one really good article I just want to bring up here uh, that was by Jonathan Chait. Oh, this it's is called, the uh, um, intelligentsia in the uh, New Yorker. Yeah. The New York, New York yeah, magazine. So, NY yeah, Mag. New York magazine. So, yeah, his article is called Zero COVID Risk is the Wrong Standard. And he defines uh, a term called zeroism. What, what Chait writes is he, he describes zeroism as the following. He says, zeroism is an inability to conceive of public health measures in cost benefit terms. The pandemic becomes an enemy that must be destroyed at all costs and any compromise could lead to death and is therefore unacceptable. So in other words, if like one person might die, then we need to continue all these emergency measures. Um, it's, and, 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 and this is the thing is that look, COVID as a pandemic is going to be over by June. Okay. But there will always be cases of COVID. It's going to return as a seasonal illness. And the question is, are we going to allow zeroism to be the policy every year? We basically give these politicians unlimited power to do lockdowns, shutdowns, no bid contracts, and on and on and on. You already see with the teachers unions, right? The education unions are refusing to go back to work, even after their members are vaccinated. 
Yeah, saying that there must be 14 days of no, meaning zero community spread before they can safely return. So the teachers unions or the education unions are saying is we're not going to go back to work. We want paid vacation until there's zero cases. Can I well, just say this is not realistic. I mean, I I um I went to get uh my daughter's passport updated at USPS. They're working. While I was driving there, I saw all kinds of infrastructure. It was happening. We pay into a system that's supposed to guarantee in return some level of commitment by individuals that buy into that same system. Teachers are part of that. Yes. You can't, you can't have a get out of jail free card whenever you want to just say, no, we're going to change the rules. And it, but it applies to everybody else. The firefighters have to show up. The cops have to show up. The ambulance people have to show up. The nurses show up. You know, the Uber USPS drivers, calls, BART, everybody train conductors, shows everybody's up, going to work. But these but people, the fucking they teachers, need, the teachers should, uh, parents should take their kids out of school. That's what they should do. And then to just, do what, Jason? How, how, how are most you, you people? Basically, well, if you got five or six work. parents they together. people okay. work. Yeah. No, no. But if you got five or six parents together and they, they don't could have time get, for that shit. Jason, who, what are you talking about? This <laughs> yeah. is yeah. not no, fucking normal. Let me finish my sentence. Okay, five or ahead. six parents get together. And if they had, if they had, um, what do you call it when you give parents a little bit of money for school? Uh, Voucher, voucher. voucher systems the voucher system would then create the competition if six or seven families could get five ten k each and then run their own little bubble school their micro school this could actually put pressure that's well, not gonna happen ever. well it's not gonna it's not gonna happen but you actually have a pretty good point what what newsom should do is he should go to these unions and say listen if you're not going to go back and you're not going to teach no problem we're going to take the money that we give to your schools and give them out as vouchers and let the parents do what they want in other words we're going to break Thank your you. union that is Correct. what he needs to do. It's time to the break problem the with union. Newsom, Newsom, the problem with Newsom is that his biggest contributor, the single biggest contributor is the education union, right? And so look, he has publicly said that, yes, I'm in favor of schools reopening, but it's not enough for you to es espouse the opinion that schools should go back. I mean, you're the governor. You need to go make that happen. You need to go tell the teachers unions. You must go back right now because there is no incremental COVID risk to the teachers. They've seen this now that states which have open schools have not seen an it's increase crazy. in COVID. There is no science to support this. He needs to tell them, go back right now or we're going to break your union. He will not do that because he's an employee of those unions. And by the way, I, I have an update. I have an update on the on the recall if you guys want it. No, wait, let's, so let's get to it in one second because I do want to okay. I, I just say, um, well, first off, I want to make an observation that we are um, turning into the rational Rush Limbaugh. We're all kind of yelling <laughs> in violent agreement. Yes. But it's <laughs> no, like, it's infuriating. It's, it it's infuriating. kind of a little bit silly, um, but uh, uh, I am just observing the tone here a little bit. Um, I, I will say, like, if you guys remember, we talked about this like last year, which is, you know, what will life be like post COVID post the pandemic? And if you guys remember, I said this, and I still firmly believe it, and I think we're now seeing it play out, which is that the fear that gets created by the actual crisis will persist in terms of the, the subconscious behavior of the population for a long period of time. That's what happened after 9-11. You know, the insanity that went on with the TSA and security checking and racism against brown people and everything that arose post 9-11 persisted for a very long time as a result of the shock that we all experienced. And I don't think people were very cognizant of it occurring. It was just like, oh, well, this is now the normal way of life. Everyone is so fearful of catching COVID and they've been so kind of trained and told that they're going to die from COVID that we're finding ourselves in a circumstance where anything can then be rationalized. And the, those are folks that then have power and the ability can magnify the circumstances into something that is, it seems kind of shocking and absurd if you put on kind of a rational hat. But this is just one manifestation of what I think will be the case. We, we were... Um, we, we, we all know people that have been vaccinated that are more than two weeks since their second shot of vaccination, who are still scared of doing things like being around other people or going into grocery stores, because quote, unquote, there may be a chance that there may be a variant that may not work on the vaccine that I may get that may end up killing me. And if you actually do the math on it, and you think about it rationally, you're not going to get COVID and you're not going to die. But there's a chance. Therefore, I'm going to change my behavior. And that's part of what I think we're seeing manifest at a very large scale is this like trained fear mind that we all have at this point. Um, and policy and everything. And, and by the yeah, no, by the way, the I, $1.9 trillion dollar stimulus is, is in part kind of empowered by this fear well, that we all have. I, 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 I disagree slightly. So look, is there going to be some P PTSD from COVID? Yeah, I'm sure there will be. But I think people are ready to to get out and um it, with a vengeance and i think people want to and and the, the problem 
is not that people are are afraid, but that the people doing the, the health establishment doing the messaging is not out there telling us the right things. I mean, you've got Fauci out there telling people that even after they're vaccinated, they cannot take off their masks until 2022. That they're not going to be able to dine. No, seriously, they're not going to be able to dine indoors. They can't go to a movie, a concert, or a sporting event, and they can't socialize indoors except with other also vaccinated people. This is what Fauci is saying. I mean, so no wonder you've got so many people out there saying that they're going to wait and see whether the vaccine works or not. Well, because effectively, Fauci and the health establishment—they're being so cautious in their guidance. They're effectively giving anti-vax messaging. They're basically saying that the vaccines don't work very well, which is just stupid. I mean, I mean they, they should be going to- out saying nobody has died who has been gotten a shot. Nobody has gone to the ICU correct. who's gotten vaccinated. No, what they need to say, what Nobody's they need to been say on is- a ventilator who's been vaccinated. Right. Am I correct with those three statements? Yes, David? yes. They need to say if you no ta- death, if you- no ICU, no ventilator if yes, you have wh- the shot. What we need to be saying is very simple, which is if you've been vaccinated, you will not die. If you've been vaccinated, you will not die. Put that on a billboard and everyone's going to want to get vaccinated. You know, only 55% of the population right now uh, says that they're going to get vaccinated as soon as they can. I'm, I'm ordering because- a billboard right now from the besties <laughs> I think that just says, if you're vaccinated, you won't die, the besties. <laughs> I think it's pretty reasonable that individuals would still be afraid, you know, because I, I think we learned over the last year that we can't trust the institutions that are supposed to tell us uh, in an objective way, meaning you can't trust the WHO, you can't trust the NIH, you can't trust the CDC, you can't necessarily trust the Surgeon General, you couldn't trust the President. Very complicated, right? So I think it's reasonable that people are skeptical. What I think is unreasonable is when, you know, sort of like organized um, unions or organizations or corporations who have a responsibility to run the infrastructure of this country basically say, um, it, it, all these rules apply to everybody else but me. Um, that's where I think uh, we have to really just kind of question ourselves and fix that. That's not cool. It's just fundamentally not reasonable. So we have Biden saying that everyone who wants a vaccine will be able to get one by the end of May. We have Gavin Newsom saying that most of the state, but not all of it, will reopen in August. Well, wait a second. You know, May, June, July, August. Wh- why is there like a three month gap here? It's because of 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 the zeroism. I mean, I think Newsom has embraced the zeroism. If not philosophy. zeroism, what's the number? We have eight thousand people die a day in America, uh, on average, historically. Well, as soon what, as everyone, sh- if it's under five hundred deaths a day, should we be going back? That's not even the question. That's not even the question. Once everyone can get a vaccine, it's over. If you choose not to get the vaccine. Like, sorry, it's on you. That's, it's on you. We're moving on. It's I like, agree. dude, We're it's done. Over. Can I ask a, can I ask a question? By the way, the, the equivalent of zeroism would be no one's allowed to drive a car because people die, die, die in cars all the or time. All cars or, have to be 35 miles an hour. Or they, or you, or, or yeah, or no one's allowed to drink alcohol because alcohol has some adverse effect or increases chance of, of cancer or, or whatever, or whatever. <laughs> At some point, like, do you end up? You just triggered Chamath. <laughs> no, yeah, sorry, Chamath. No wine? <laughs> nice Bordeaux and Burgundy doesn't give you cancer. No. But, What's going uh, on with the wine budget <laughs> post spacocalypse? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's going to take a lot of it's going to take a lot of more billions before I stop drinking my wine. Um, question: um, I want to throw this into the scrum. Um, what do you guys think scrummy. about? Uh, I, by the way, I mean, also we're all just so punchy because we didn't talk last week. So totally, we're all, no. we're all so we're agitated. All a little excited. We're, we're none a little of us excited have gotten to, to talk. All of our wives have been telling us what to do. We had nobody to vent with, and now we're just exactly. going crazy. It's <laughs> like a is, bunch of twelve-year-old boys who are on timeout. <laughs> it's like it's like it's like we've been in a two-week timeout. We need to um, get our bikes and go for a bike ride. No, 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 guys. Honestly, honestly, like, have you guys? Like, I have not gotten a word in edgewise with Matt for two weeks, and I was so <laughs> looking forward to talking to you guys. I'm like, oh, I, I want to talk. Um, no, but. Listen, uh, no, no what comment. do you guys what do you guys think about the uh, the the biological Patriot Act thing? You know, there's these vaccination passports that people are talking about. I just want to get a sense of where you guys think this is going and, and, and this what is you the, think this about is the it. slippery slope that I think ends all slippery slopes with respect to privacy, right? So there, there, I think it was proposed in the EU that you would need to get a, you know, a digitally verified kind of passport stamp that shows that you have been vaccinated in order to travel freely amongst other EU nations. Um, And so if you think about the implications of this, now the government or governments have the ability to demand that in order for you to move around freely, 
you need to represent something digitally or represent something about some healthcare procedure that you may or may not want to kind of, uh, you know, take on. So that's sound. everyone kind of nods their head and says that seems totally reasonable and rational. It's COVID, we're all at risk, we should protect Hard ourselves, I wanna, yeah. yada, yada. But where does this go next, right? Because then it becomes, well, have you had your measles vaccine? Or, you know, hey, you know, do you have um, herpes? And therefore, you can't, you have to show someone your herpes passport if you want to have sex with them, or, you know, end up kind of going to a point where we we really don't have a barrier between what's private and what's nationalized, um, or, or even super nationalized in, in, the, in the context of the EU. Um, and, you know, is there kind of a slippery slope that emerges by allowing this amount of invasiveness of personal decision making and personal data, and making it available to government agencies in order to have access to the liberties that you, you know, believe may be endowed to you as an individual citizen uh, of the world? Or so what do you do? What do we Sax? do? Well, I, I, I just think proposals like this are, I, I think they're going to fade away very quickly once COVID is over. And, and, and the, the real issue we have right now is that not enough of the population wants to get vaccinated because, again, the health authorities are being much too conservative in their guidance. So, I, you know, there's some polling numbers on this that, so only 15% of the public are actually opposed to getting the vaccine, like you kind of call them anti-vax. But there's another 20 to 30 percent that are taking this wait and see approach. And, you know, they're going to make sure that like other people go first and don't sprout tails or antlers or something before, you know, they're going to be willing to get it. But but the reason why they're all waiting and seeing is because you've got, you know, Fauci and others saying that we're not going to have normalcy until Christmas or maybe even 2022. So if, if if that's the case, if things aren't going to be normal till next year, why wouldn't you wait? You know, and I think what we need to be saying is, look, go get the vaccine. Where everyone who wants this can be able to get it in the next two months, and COVID is over. It's over, guys. But Sachs, if there is a digital passport requirement in the EU, where do you think that goes? Like, if you have to show proof of a vaccination in order to that's enter the nuts. EU without quarantine, where, do, well, where does this go? I, yeah, it's 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 not a great precedent. But I but I I, I don't know that it's going to be necessary because I just think that COVID's going to end. There is a so, self, so quickly. It's it's a this I, I like Sachs's point of view, which is if you decide you're not going to do this, then you've put yourself at risk. But if nobody else can die from it, why do we need to check it? I understand, like maybe in this bridge period spring to summer if you go to a warriors game or a knicks game where you want to go to burning man or the edc you know electronic daisy carnival whatever uh freeberg goes to you know uh when he goes to his raves i mean freeberg at a rave is kind of the video we need to see i think but wh why would uh, that's fine with me but in the short term but in the long term i don't want to give them that power look what happened with the patriot act and then them monitoring our data forever and the government being able to put you know, what Snowden found out, like they were able to put on the AT&T backbone, the ability to sniff all data. I mean, it's overreaching. Last January uh, or February, I think, Jason, it was one of our first pods where I kind of put this marker out there on this biological Patriot Act and it said it, it's coming. I'm going to put another marker out there, um, by the way, because like, you know, there may be something like this in New York. I think most cities will have to have them. I think places, Jason, exactly as you say, for sporting events, for concerts, it'll be very hard um, as the number of strains increase, as the severity ebbs and flows over time for us to not end up in this place. And I think it will be because certain people will feel a paternalistic um desire to sort of you know it'll come from a good place like i want to help everybody but they'll pass a law and that law will just get perturbed and 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 it'll create all kinds of crazy consequences but i want to put another shit out there which is you know there was a really important civil rights case called masterpiece cake shop versus colorado uh, civil rights commission it went to the supreme court and it was basically a a, a guy who owned um a bakery and he refused i think it was to make a cake for a same-sex couple um, and ultimately, you know, the decision was, yeah, he's allowed. The Supreme Court gave a very narrow ruling that he was allowed to withhold service. And I asked this question, which is, well, what is the difference, frankly, between withholding service from a same sex couple or withholding service from somebody that isn't vaccinated? Um, because, you know, in the eyes of the business person, you know, as assuming apparently you're allowed to make these kinds of, you know, judgments. Uh, because you're a private business, the implications I think are really vast. Um, and so I'm just going to put it out there that I think that uh, it's actually David, I'll take the other side. So I think that there's going to be these biological Patriot Acts, unfortunately. 
And then the second thing that I'll say is that I do think that it will get litigated to the Supreme Court. And I think that narrowly, what will come down is that businesses will be able to decide. And I think this is actually what will put the vaccination or anti-vaccination movement to the forefront. Because I think in this complex global world where we don't know where diseases come from, except we know that they are more communicable, they can be more deadly, and they're more pervasive, and they spread faster just because of the nature in which the world is set up, there's going to there's probably going to be less and less tolerance for anti vaccination. Now that may slow down the actual process of getting vaccines to market. um, Because we'll want to make it even safer if we're going to do forced vaccinations of certain things. But I'm just going to put a put a chit out there that I think that that's well, I, I don't know that we need to force people to get vaccinated, but I think that we need to recognize that once people have the option of getting vaccinated, there's no need to have the same public policy response, right? So, so look, if Biden's correct that we're going to have 300 million doses by end of May, and I think he must be correct because he's been very conservative in his guidance, then we should declare a date certain for the end of COVID. I'm not saying that the virus won't exist. I'm not saying there won't be a smattering of cases. I'm saying from a public policy perspective, there's no longer a panic, a raging pandemic to justify these incredible new powers that the government has asserted. I mean, what would you do that based on? The number of shots in arms or the number of deaths per day? No, it's look, once- once everyone can get the vaccine, and I think that'll okay, be so by availability. Memorial Day. Availability. So, I mean, look, okay. what we should say, and, and it will be available as long as, you know, governors like Newsom get out of the way and stop restricting the administration of it. But I think we need to declare a date certain where we say, listen, on June 1st, there is no more justification for government having these extraordinary powers to lock us down, to require us. I, I don't think we even need to wear masks beyond June 1st. And by the way, I was pro mask. I was in favor of a mask mandate a year ago, as you guys know. But there's no need for it after June 1st. There's no need to have these um, crazy. Certainly not you if know, you're no vaccinated, right, Freeberg? Like, I mean, it, it, you wouldn't. It doesn't matter. I, I, it doesn't matter. I, I just, um, you know, I think it's uh, it's a good point that Sachs is making. It's easy for people to say, let's wear a mask and protect ourselves. But if you don't care about wearing a mask, but there are plenty of people who do. And I, I think the question is, at what point do we allow liberty to kind of play a role here? And it's it's not just about, you know, what one person's point of view, which by the way, turned out to be wrong multiple times over the last year, um, is uh, in terms of what they think that other people should do. And you know, what, what, is, what does it mean to actually have freedom of choice and, and liberty? Um, well, I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's a really, it's a really fundamental be, question. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you look at states, uh, that is a key. We have Texas has opened up and said no mass mandate. One of the things that hurt us in this was we didn't have a centralized government dictating everything. And now we see like, well, hey, maybe okay, having so states making individual decisions By the way, by the way I, I, I don't good. know if that's necessarily true. I'll say something about this that I think is important. It may be true that masks stop community spread of the virus, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we stop the spread of the virus. The virus still spread. We still had a lot of viral cases in the United States. We had a lot of deaths that arose. And whatever restrictions we put in place, people still made the choice to go into other people's homes, take their mask off, enjoy free air, enjoy drinks, and give each other the virus. And that's where so much of the spread occurred. I think you guys are not confronting this really obvious thing. I think like this masterpiece cake shop thing is a really important concept. Like what happens, I'm just going to use an extreme example. If it goes to the say, Supreme Court, you mean? No, let's just say that, you know, Google's engineers unionize and they decide that, you know, they want everybody else at Google to be vaccinated. And then Google says, yeah, you're right. If you want to work at Google, you need to be vaccinated. Not just private for COVID. Private company. Private company. Not just for COVID. It's a private company. Not just I for mean, COVID. By the way, that is a rule at schools, right? I mean, I think my my uh, my yeah. preschool where my kid goes here in San Francisco requires vac- proof of vaccination for the kids in order for but them to go to school. But traveling seems to be different. And see, traveling in some places is on oh, wait, just public Jason, infrastructure, but, some on private infrastructure. I know, right? but just, just, just focus on this issue. What happens if private organizations pass a decision? Yeah. That you have to be vaccinated. It'll go yeah. to the Supreme Court. And if you look at Masterpiece, they they'll win. They will be they will they will come out with the right to say that. Which is fine. 
You can go but work why, somewhere else. Why is that? Why is that a problem? Exactly. Yeah, no, no I'm just, curi- I'm just curious how this plays here. out. If if only half the population of America, well, maybe they'll more. lose good engineers, and the free market will resolve itself. Where exactly. Google will end up saying, you know what, we're not going to pass this mandate because all the good engineers are going to leave. So let's just leave it. You know, leave it be. Um, I'm 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 more worried about the politicians the trying to hold yeah. ho- the government trying to hold on to the power yeah. that it's asserted over us over the past year, even after COVID's no That's longer a threat. I don't want That's them the having a database of my medical records. No right. effing and way. So, uh, this is why, look, I think we need to declare a date serv- certain that COVID as a pandemic is over. My date is Memorial Day. It's very clear to me that once everyone has the vaccine, it's over. Just but make look, it when I you think can this walk is, up. This is when, yeah, th- this is when, so I actually think that the Newsom recall, which will be in, will be going on this summer. Uh, this is what that election is going to turn into, in my p- opinion. Is so. So, by the way, quick, can I give a quick update on? Yes, please. Uh, okay, so I talked to the recall uh, people this morning. They're up to one point nine five million Uh-oh. signatures. He's done. So fifty thousand votes short of two million. They will be at or over two million in two weeks, which is the end of the signature period. Their validation rate is about eighty four percent. So I think this is clearly going to pass. There will be a recall election. It will be around August. Now, fast forward. Newsom has said the state won't reopen until August, but I think that by May, June, July, you will see just about every other state reopen. Obviously, Texas is already completely reopened, but even blue states like Connecticut have now lifted lockdowns. They still have a mass mandate for the time being. But I think what you could see by this summer is that California will look like a laggard. You'll see that politicians like Newsom are holding on to the zeroist philosophy. They're being too restrictive. They look ridiculous compared to other states. And he still probably won't have an agreement with the teachers unions to go back to school. And uh, I think this could become the big issue in the in the. You want to make an announcement, Sax? You want to make an announcement (laughs) now? We have a special announcement. I mean, no, Tamath Tam- 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 might be taking a you know Tamath <laughs> might be taking a hiatus from work given where the markets are. I, mean, at. I, he, he could, I thought you know, I thought could, this governor thing would be value destructive. It looks like actually I would have saved money. <laughs> I would have sold you all your positions. You okay, I'm back. <laughs> Fuck it, I'm, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I'm doing it again. I'm back in. I'm back in positions. I mean, oh my god! I don't mean to be cynical, but if you I am losing so much money. Wow! In your state, Sachs. They can't collect signatures at the supermarket or at restaurants or Disneyland. So maybe yeah. maybe Newsom shut everything down so that no, you couldn't well, collect got, SIGs. Well, it's interesting because th- they actually found that direct mail was a very effective way of getting signatures. Ooh. So they've gotten around that. But, so but Gavin remember, Newsom is cutting the budget of the U.S. Postal Service. <laughs> no, look, Newsom is definitely – there's going to be a recall election. I think it will be around August. And now there's uh, recall efforts underway for uh, Chase Aboudin. The, the killer uh, DA? The killer DA of San Francisco. And, oh, we, as well as Gascon in LA and the San Francisco school board. But we got to talk, you know, we got to talk about how Boudin responded to our last pod, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my David, Lord. David, I, I have three comments to say before we talk about Boudin. Number one, I've never seen you more energetic. Did you get, <laughs> yeah. did you, where did are you? you? The red did you get, man, did you, yeah. did did you get Miami. a Miami? Did you Keith download Lewis? a fourth emotion? Did you download a fourth emotion? <laughs> He's in Palm here. Beach. He's been at the massage parlor every morning. No, it's, it's <laughs> like a up. You're right. It's like yeah. a build up over the last two weeks. It's like a, you know. Uh, yeah, big release. Too much, yeah. too much, uh, how, too much uh, energy. Yeah. I mean, how, how, how little have you spoken in the last two weeks? Has Jacqueline spoken the entire <laughs> two weeks? Straight? I know what She's that feels like. So you're right. You're right. I, I, need, uh, I need the bestie therapy. I didn't realize yeah. I needed this. Yeah, absolutely. Is, bestie it's therapy. It's bestie so does the therapy. audience. Jake Al Freeberg, you guys, you don't know this, but Saxy and I called each other on Friday and we spoke for half an hour and like as <laughs> it was a podcast. <laughs> Just back and forth. <laughs> you know, you can conference we were call so, on iPhone. We were yeah. so lonely. He did. He actually yeah. conference called the, all four of us. I picked up and we spoke for half an hour. It felt like a mini pod. It was so wonderful. Oh my God. Oh my <laughs> we, God. But you know what? Men are too proud to, uh, men are too proud to go to therapy so they start podcasts. I was telling a friend of mine, I was, I, was telling, I was telling a friend like this podcast was kind of one of the surprising joys of my life over the last year. It really felt like a great kind Wait, Wait a second, of, uh, you got the joy? Oh, we I did had joy. your joy. We did have yeah. the joy. You downloaded joy? Yeah, I acknowledge <laughs> joy now. <laughs> okay. He's, they're both <laughs> smiling. Wow, it's incredible. Oh, yeah. Okay, Sax, go tell us about Boudin. Yeah, okay, tell us about so, Boudin. Uh, yeah, let me find the, the tweet. So basically, you know, remember on the last Parker. pod two weeks ago, we, uh, Chesa <laughs> was supposed to be on our pod. He canceled. And so then in response to that, Jason, hold the chicken noises for a couple of minutes here. Hold on. 
So uh, I responded to Chasa saying, listen, you don't have to come on our pod, but I'll challenge you to debate. Let's do a debate, whatever format you want. And we posted it on on Twitter. So he didn't respond. But it, by the way, it got like 180,000 views. So a lot of people watched the challenge. And so, but the crazy thing is, instead of responding directly, Chasa had a high school friend and campaign worker <laughs> post a blog responding to me which and, and jason got mentioned too but it was crazy it was like why won't you just respond directly anyway he had this this uh shill respond and what he basically said was uh in this response was he cited all these charging statistics and he tried to claim that chasa has charged just as many cases as the previous da the problem with that is charging doesn't re really mean anything because you can charge someone and then plead the charges down from a felony to a misdemeanor. It doesn't mean that the person was actually punished. It doesn't mean that you locked anybody up. It, do it doesn't mean that you actually got a conviction to a serious crime or protected the public from anything. The, the real question is not chargings, but dispositions of cases. And that's the real, th that's the data that we need. And I know there's a bunch of reporters who are trying to get that data mm. and Chase's office won't give it to him. Mm. And so, you know, I would, I would challenge this, um, this little uh, Chase volunteer, you know, go find out, you know, what, what is the real data on, you know, how many felony charges have been pleaded down to misdemeanors, right? How many felonies have actually been prosecuted? How many felony convictions well, it's interesting has Chase you bring this secured? Up. It's interesting yeah. you bring this up. If you do a search for GoFundMe Chesa Budin, the number one result should be the the um, the GoFundMe page I started. It now has 455 donors and $54,000 in funding. And so I am withdrawing the $54,000. And I have a meeting with the woman from the Marina Times, uh, who's done great coverage of this. And I'm also looking for some data scientists. And I'm going to give the money minus some insurance for when Chessa sues me <laughs> and some errors and omissions insurance. And I'm going to be giving the $50,000 to a journalist or a data scientist, or they can spend it however they want to, to attack this very issue, which is just put more sunlight on it. And so Chessa Budin is uh, not happy with me. He's not happy with Sachs, uh, but we are going to put the spotlight on him. And it will be through journalism and it will be through yeah. constant pressure. And you can help if you want to donate $100, go just donate it to that. I'm not taking any money, obviously. This um, is a really interesting civics experiment, I think, for the rest of the country. And I, I want to say that I, I don't know enough of these details. I go up to San Francisco every now and then. I don't, I've not liked what I've scary. seen. Scary. It's scary. Um, and it's great that you guys are standing up for your city. The, the thing is, I wonder how much of these recall movements now will pick up steam not just here, but wherever else they're allowable all around the country. I mean, you know, the San Francisco Board of Education spent all this time and money, you know, basically navel gazing on the renaming of schools. Oh. And then finally, just because they were just so utterly embarrassed, basically had to bag that. Could you imagine that in the most technically advanced and most progressive city in the world, basically, with the kinds of companies and people that we have here, that that's what people were thinking about during the middle of a pandemic when children were at home. Okay, uh, you have this DA who's going to get basically recalled. In Los Angeles, you have a DA that's going to get recalled. In California, you have an entire, you know, governor of the state that's going to get recalled. So what are we learning? We're learning that people can actually, small numbers of people can be extremely effective at getting change done. Good for and you guys. that they represent us and that the distance between what the public clearly wants and what some of these bought and paid for radically insane people both on the left and the right that needs to stop and if people are you know going to people not listen to their centrism. constituents we need to stop them people want people want centrism they want simple centrism 100 percent reason people want reason yeah the silliness is that the san francisco board of uh, education people are elected when have any of you or any of the people that I know in San Francisco ever actually looked up who's the person on the Board of Education? It's not really a topic that people have paid much attention to. And I think that um, this experience, when you don't pay attention from a civic perspective on who your elected officials are and take an action in, in electing them, you wake up when a crisis like this occurs and you're like, oh, shit, maybe I should pay attention the next time there's an election. And maybe I should be more active and be more thoughtful. Or maybe we should end up in a situation where you allow the mayor or the board of supervisors to appoint the board and have an approval process where there's a little bit more kind of not just anyone that wants to get elected puts themselves on the ballot. 
gets elected. No one really pays attention to who's getting elected. And then you wake up to this crisis. Isn't, isn't it true that like in the Board of Education, there was this whole, the whole thing came to a head because they were trying to like staff a committee again to waste time on some bullshit. Yeah. And some guy, some guy raised his hand and, you know, he happened to be this, you know, gay person uh, in a mixed cultural marriage, I think. And he wanted to be a part of this committee and he had been kind of like a really good, thoughtful participant. And they said no because he wasn't diverse enough or something. Yes, so, that's, exa that that's, exa that's exactly what happened. There was a school board meeting. It started at 4 p.m., okay, 4 p.m. And this was the first issue they discussed is whether, the, like you said, this, this gay white man was diverse enough to be on a committee. It was a committee where he was volunteering his time. Time, his good and time. And everybody thought that he'd be additive. I mean, you know, everybody liked him. But they spent several hours debating whether they should put him on for diversity reasons. Because he, anyway, he wasn't woke right, enough. Right, exactly. Then they spent their time talking about renaming schools and taking Abraham Lincoln's names off schools and even renaming schools. They didn't even know wh why certain names were what they were. They got were. the people was, wrong. They got, <laughs> they the, got people the people wrong. wrong. And then basically, they didn't even get to the issue of school reopening until midnight. So eight hours later. And then everyone basically had gone to bed and it, the meeting ended. I mean, literally, this is what happened. And so the, the, the parents. <laughs> it's like an SNL skit. It's like insane. It's, it's insane. And so, you know, the parents are up in arms and this is triggering a recall movement because the parents just want the schools reopened. And you keep getting these, um, responses from the school board where, the, where they keep saying, Oh, we're, we're listening to your concerns or whatever. They keep trying to process them, but they're not doing anything about it, you know? And then, and then they say, well, in order for us to reopen, we need to establish our testing infrastructure and we're putting an RFP out for that. And blah, blah, blah. And it's like, what are you talking about? Private schools have reopened. Just reopen, you know, just reopen. What do you guys think about um, Joe Biden's first sort of 60 days in office? Executing at a high level with the vaccine. I mean, opening up all those FEMA sites and getting to 2 million shots a day on average is undeniably great. The fact that he used the War Powers Act to force Merck and to, to do the uh, J Johnson and Johnson, uh, and to work with Johnson Johnson to increase production, undeniable. Um, I'm not, ha and I'm not happy about, you know, um, the teachers and him kowtowing to the teachers. And I'm not happy about just the hint that he wants to start the war machine up again. So, you know, yeah, bombing uh, Syria. Who wants? Who here wants to bomb Syria? It's like a right of. Passage. I don't want to. I don't want to drop bombs on anybody president. anymore. Where? It's where? Just, where the yeah. fuck is Syria? Does anybody know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, why? The, why? What? What? What are we doing? I mean, it, I, it, it, our, that's, our the, that's those is, are the key issues for me. There's the teachers yeah. and the bombings. I, I don't want that. I, I see. I, I give him an eight out of ten, uh, Jason, because I think the pandemic has been so well handled by him and Zions and that team. I think they've done a very good job. But those They're two focused. things. Those two things are huge black marks for me. Like. He, and, and Bloomberg ripped him one, you know, and Mike Bloomberg was on TV and he was just like, that is a joke. The teachers unions are jokes and you need to basically have to tear these people to the ground. You have to, they, and you cannot allow these folks to hold an entire generation of kids hostage. Okay. It's but then, and then the day, doing. I think it was the same day or the day after, unfortunately, Biden kind of capitulated to the teachers union, not cool. And then this, the bombing of Syria was kind of like, why? Um, yeah, let's use sac sanctions. Let's use money. I mean, the, the the legacy of Trump, I think, not starting wars was the one thing, and then him, you know, just backing up the Brinks truck for the light speed. Those are the two best things he did, and those are two things that we should say. You know what? He got those things right. Let's carry those forward. We have to crack the teachers' unions. Uh, the teachers' union, the, the voucher system, is the only way to do it, and it's very reasonable to say parents who are paying shit tons of taxes should be able to take that money and educate their kids however they damn please. And if we're going to spend fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 per student on public education, as a parent, whether you're in Brooklyn or Boise, Idaho, you should have access to that 15k and I, you should Jason, pick where it goes and you should take control of it. That's the way to I, stop this Michigana. Jake, I had the I had the this crazy realization as you, as you were saying this, which is like, <laughs> if you said if I said to you, you know, electricians union, I would say thumbs up. Auto workers union, thumbs up. SEIU generally, thumbs up. Um, nurses unions, thumbs up. But if I say teachers union, I just have this incredibly negative connotation now of an incredibly political class of people who are going completely out of their way 
to basically just like have exceptions and asterisks that apply to them and them only. It's, I don't know. Am I the only one that feels that way? It just seems like it's trending to where like teachers union is almost becoming teachers. a four letter word. Yeah. I don't think they care about teachers. Yeah. They, they don't care about students. These but unions, do, but unions uh, in union general do a very important job. The teachers job. or the students. Yeah. No, but I think unions in general do a really important job. And I think that, you know, like all these other unions, I have a very positive thought about what they're meant to be. You, you can unions. be pro-union or pro-organized labor, but be against this specific union. That's what I'm saying. Just like you can be uh, pro-reforming criminal justice and the unfairness of it, while still being against Chesa Budin's insanity that people should be able to be murdered and killed and beaten in the streets. With impunity. Yeah. With impunity. Well, like yeah. this, did, is, yeah. th these, this is not an even, did, uh, th this did, is a completely logical position to have. I want to not put people in jail for cannabis sales and I want to remove people from non for non-violent offenders from the, the incarceration. You can believe that while believing you should incarcerate somebody who murders somebody. This is not a hard logic to understand. Right. Totally. No, you're right. I mean, the, 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 it's, it's a combination of ideology and special interests um, working against common sense and what the average citizen wants, you know? Right. And, and did and you, see, it's do not you see what happened? Republican you, or, it's not Republican right. or Democrat, David. You and I agree on this. And yeah, we're of on course. Other we, just want, we just want common sense government that functions for uh, the people as opposed to special interests or these radical ideologies. I want to have a couple of pops at the battery and go walk to another bar without having to fear that somebody's going to stab me for my goddamn iPhone. You know, or, or, or some poor kid's going to get attacked by somebody deranged out of their mind on fentanyl. Look, this is why Newsom's going to get recalled is because crime and education are just fundamental issues. We do not feel safe in our cities. Crime is out of control and we're going crazy that we can't send our kids to schools. These are issues that affect cities and suburbs. Everyone's on the same page. And I think you're right that the teachers unions have overplayed their hand and exposed themselves as not caring about the kids, just looking out for their own benefits. They want to be on paid vacation forever, effectively. And do you see there was a great um, example where in Oakley, which is a town in the East Bay, the whole, uh, they were caught on, uh, recorded on oh, Zoom. Oh, the hot mic. <laughs> yeah, the hot, there's a hot mic where the entire school board was forced to resign because they got caught mocking parents for, for quote, wanting their babysitters back so they could smoke pot. I mean, the cynicism here is unbelievable. I mean, these, these people are supposed to care about teaching young people and they, and they view themselves as just babysitters. Yeah. You know, and they view and parents as stoners. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we we got to shake up this system, and 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 the problem is competition. The, 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 we need competition, and look, the problem is that that the people that when you have unions running the schools, there's no reward for excellence. The bad the bad people don't get fired, and the good people don't get rewarded. So they, you know, if you're pro, if you're anti competition, you are a moron. Everything in this world gets better when people compete on the playing field, in the arena, to build better products and services. And in healthcare, and in education, and in housing, the government, and dare I say it, the far left, is stopping people from competing. We should look at ourselves as customers. And that's what's happening right now. People are saying, we're the customer, Gavin Newsom and Chesa Budin, we don't want that product. That product, get the, he get the hell out of here with that product and give us something reasonable. No person who's Republican, no person who's Democratic doesn't want safety and doesn't want competition in education. The only people who don't, who want to stop competition in education are special interests, period. Amen. Man, you've been you've Sorry, been these red pills red are pills. fucking great. Man, these red Man, pills, wow. These Peter Thiel red <laughs> pills are, woo! God. Man, I thought Adderall was good, but God, these Miami, Keith Raboy, P Peter Thiel, Stanford red pills got me lit. I'm ready to go. All right, anybody give a shit about NFTs? Non-fungible tokens? I mean, I think it's kind of brilliant, but- uh, By the way, don't we only have two minutes? Two minutes. And if I, mean, I, I maybe, think we should wrap. Maybe, I think we should let, wrap on wrap. the red pills. Yeah. I mean, that you can't beat that. That was can't hot. beat some red pills. <laughs> that was hot. When are we going to see each other? I I can't take it anymore. I'm like a caged animal. I need to get out of here. I need I, to get on one of your planes. I, I'm doing a. Freebird, I'm doing, where's your plane? Get me I'm on the plane. I'm doing a home and away poker game on Wednesday and Thursday. Wednesday in LA, Thursday up here, but it's five hundred and a thousand, Jason. Oh yeah. 
Oh. <laughs> and you got to play both I'll days. Come. You got to play both days, so you can't play one or the other. You got to play both days. Oh, boy. Jamath is trying to make his billions back. <laughs> I don't know if I want to be in a 501 1K game, though. No, I'm going to go past that. How is that, that any different than the normal game? I mean, like, in you fact, know. In fact. I just, you know, you can't limp in with your aces. It's just you're going to get demolished, get four callers. That Yeah. Yeah, Rick Solomon will jump the fence with the seven eight and bust him. <laughs> and laugh and laugh and, and laugh. Nick, Nick, you got to edit all this out. No, you don't. <laughs> this is the best part. <laughs> the, ma- the matcha king of Malibu. The Malibu the matcha, matcha king. Matcha king, exactly. M- Malibu. Tell him I'll take a matcha with extra honey. All right, everybody. For the queen of quinoa, for Rain Man David Sachs, and for the demolished dictator who will <laughs> rebuild. I believe in you, Chamath. You can rebuild it. You can rebuild that chip in a chair. Come on. Let's get back in the game. Chip in a chair. Give us another. I-P-O-G-H, whatever. Oh Q. Gosh. Let's go, everybody. And we'll see you next time. Love you guys. Thanks to our sponsors. Bye, guys. That don't exist. Back at you. Back at you. Back back at at you. At you. Ditto. <laughs> All right, love you, besties. We'll let your winners ride. Rain Man David Sack. Source it to the fans, and they've just gone crazy with it. Love you, West. Ice Queen of Kinwa. Where did you get merch? Are I'm back. going all in.